regicide is not a matter ever to be taken lightly. Today on Young Heretics, we're going to be talking about something that is in the news a ton these days, and that is freedom of speech. You've probably heard a lot, if you're reading the news at all, about cancel culture, which is fundamentally a debate about free speech. There is a growing movement, a growing sort of American trend of hounding people out of their jobs because they wear the wrong t-shirt or, you know, making people apologize for saying the wrong thing or wearing the wrong t-shirt. I, I wrote a piece about this in Newsweek this week that, um, kind of covers, you know, the, the New York Times is, is sort of having these internal convulsions over this. Barry Weiss, one of their big writers, just left because she felt that they basically were not tolerant of any opposing viewpoints. And, you know, the list goes on and on. You probably don't need me to cite all of the examples. And obviously, from my perspective, this is this is a serious problem. I am a devotee of that quintessentially American, but also, I think, Western notion of freedom of speech, the liberty to say what you believe and feel and think without being hounded out of your job, for example. Now, one of the things I've been thinking about is that we gesture toward freedom of speech a lot, those of us who oppose cancel culture. But that's actually not enough. This is a profound idea, the idea of freedom of speech. It's not a given not all several civilizations have it now, not all civilizations have had it in the past. And so since this show is about giving you the classical education that you may have been denied, one of the things that we're going to do today is, is just go back into the roots of the idea of free speech and look at one of the foundational texts for, for freedom of speech, and that is Milton's Areopagitica. You, you may never have heard of it. You, you, Milton is not read enough these days in general. He's best known as the writer of Paradise Lost, which is his great epic poem about the fall of man. And we're going to get into that a little bit on this episode. But before he wrote that, he was what you would call a pamphleteer. He wrote prose political works uh, during one of the most turbulent periods in England's history, during the 1640s is when this was written. So we're going to talk today all about Areopagitica and try to sort of gain a deeper understanding from it of, of freedom of speech, which is this precious heritage that we are in danger of losing. The takeaway, I hope, for us is going to be that debates about freedom of speech and intense struggles over things like cancel culture happen whenever people in the West realize how powerful words actually are. I think we forget a lot of the time when we sort of, I, we talk on the show a lot about getting complacent, about sort of winning a freedom and then forgetting about it and not really paying that much attention to it. When a new medium comes into the world, which is what we have right now with the internet, right? The blowing the doors open on speech. When all these people are suddenly able to, to speak, suddenly, again, the people get antsy and they want to shut speech down because speech is volatile and it has serious consequences. And Milton knew that. He lived during a time when people were coming to realize that as well. And it will behoove us to study that time. So that's what we're going to do today. Before I jump into Milton and the area Pagitica, however, I just briefly on this one show want to take a little extra moment to, first of all, thank everybody who is listening to this show and watching it and has been listening to it and watching it. I, I knew that this show was going to be fun to do. I did not realize how fun. I didn't realize what a blast it was going to be. And especially it's been almost, you know, overwhelming to see these, you know, reading those five-star reviews on iTunes and, you know, hearing what you guys are thinking about the show, wherever you're engaging with me about it on Twitter or email or whatever, you know, it's such a joy to see you guys discovering these these texts maybe for the first time or, or coming back to them with me, uh, that is bliss. So thank you. Thank you for being with us on this journey. I would like to make a request for your support because one of the ways that podcasts like this grow, you know, we, we are not, we do not have like a massive distribution platform or something. This is a grassroots uh, mom and pop shop over here. And, and we rely on you to help people know about the show. So if you have not already subscribed, wherever you get your podcasts, please do subscribe. If you have not left a five-star review on iTunes, I would love if you would do that. It's incredibly helpful for us. And it's also incredibly helpful if you just share this. Whenever you like 
tell people about stuff word of mouth on the on the just over email with a friend or on twitter or wherever um get the word out about young heretics if you could because it is taking a really wonderful shape and i want more people to hear about it and i would love if you could help me with that that is all i'm going to say about that except once more to say thank you for listening let's get into don milton so first things first right who is don milton why does he come to be writing this sort of imagined speech in favor of freedom of speech. Well, he's born in 1608. So that's the era that we're looking at here, the 17th century in England. And he came of age during what is probably maybe the most turbulent period of British history, especially when he's writing this. It's in the middle of the civil wars. So, so Britain, we don't actually talk too terribly much about this anymore, but Britain had these uh, civil wars, uh, violent uprisings. Um, and, and let's just revisit a little bit what we talked about when I interviewed uh, Senator Ted Cruz back in the day, right? We, I, I mentioned then this history of Magna Carta, which, which is back in the, the 1200s, 1215 AD. You have this kind of uprising of the barons, who are the English gentry, against the king, who, among other things, is is taxing them out the ears. Right, he's taxing them way, way more than they can s- sustain, and they basically invoke the rights of God, and and they bind the king to the law. This sort of new and and thrilling idea that it's not just the divine right of kings to kind of just come down from on high and do whatever they want to whomever they want. Um, with King John, who was this tyrant, this terrible tyrant king, they basically said, no, you also must obey the laws of God. The laws of God are above us all. That's Magna Carta. It's a hugely pivotal moment in the history of England. And that sort of dynamic continues throughout English history. This dynamic where you have basically, you've got the gentry, the, the, the moneyed nobles, you've got the monarchy, which is still entirely in place. Remember that the king is still very powerful in this throughout these periods, but you, you, and then you have the church, right? Which is kind of in some senses mediating between the two or serving as an outside arbiter. In, in Magna Carta, in those, those days, you had the Archbishop of Canterbury kind of stepped in to mediate between the two sides, the barons and the king. So Magna Carta basically establishes this tradition of looking outside of the monarchy to God and to the church for some sort of universal reference of, of law. And eventually this will become, among other things, it'll become the tradition of human rights. I mean, that we wouldn't even really think in those terms if, the, if these things hadn't happened. Fast forward, England has England goes through many periods of religious convulsion, which we won't sort of get into too deeply here. But by the time Milton is born, England is basically Protestant. They have the, the, the Protestant Reformation obviously has occurred. And the the there was a, a brief sort of moment after England became Protestant with, with Henry VIII, um, fam- the famous Bloody Mary, uh, who kind of tried to force England back violently back into, um, into Catholicism. But then that basically failed, Elizabeth I establishes what will eventually become the Church of England. So now it, England has this Protestant church. They're effectively Calvinists. They have these two sort of creeds or confessions, um, the, the 39 Articles and the Lambeth Articles, they're called. And that, you know, in, in Reformed churches and in Protestant churches, instead of a pope, a lot of times what you have is this sort of statement of faith and belief, and that's what you what you hold people to. So England is, is becoming established as a, a Protestant state. But eventually, the, you have, at this point, you have what's called the Stuart monarchy, and, and that is the dynasty that includes um, King Charles. Charles I is the, the king that is sort of will be part of this civil war as, as it sort of takes off. Charles is not a popular king with the noblemen who still exist and who now at this point, right, there, there is this, this parliament, which now is obviously the central part of British government. At that point, parliament was convened kind of by the king. So to a certain extent, they're still under the king's jurisdiction, but they have this tradition of, of appealing to God to look to, and, and they, they begin to become extremely, extremely upset with Charles for a number of reasons, primarily to do again with taxation. 
um, because because Charles is is basically getting embroiled in wars in in Europe on the continent, and the and and Parliament is beginning again to kind of chafe essentially at at having to pay all this money for a king that they don't entirely even really support. This establishes this fascinating dynamic, right? Because the king technically gets to do essentially what he wants, but he can't do anything without money. And in order to get money, he has to convene a parliament so that they can tax basically themselves and others. They can levy, they can raise taxes. Typically, when a monarch at this stage came to the throne, parliament would basically grant him a right in perpetuity to raise some of his funds. They did not do this for Charles, which made him very upset. And, and so they, you now have this basically, Parliament becomes this box that, that Charles doesn't want to open because his money's in it. But if you open it, you also basically like convene this, this legal body that has all this power to like shake their fists at you. Um, this is a, the other thing that's going on at the same time is that Charles has married a, a Catholic and that makes Parliament, much of, much of which is Protestant, right? Ca- Parliament's worried that he's basically going to slide back into Catholicism or covertly make them go back to Catholicism, which is, which is horrifying to this, this, uh, this Protestant parliament. So even before Milton really comes on the scene, there have been skirmishes between King Charles and, and parliament. At a certain point, they, they tried to impeach him and he dissolves parliament. In 1628, he convenes them again, and one at that point he convenes them, including Oliver Cromwell, who's going to be a really important figure in this in this sort of whole civil war. And they draw up what's called a petition of right, which makes reference back to the Magna Carta and to the you know to the principle of habeas corpus and all of this stuff. And after big squabbles, they they basically get Charles f- effectively to concede again to this reassertion of parliamentary right. So there's there's this this popular sovereignty, the sort of demand for, for uh, representative government of some form, mostly, again, of the noble the noblemen at this point. But there's this demand for, for the, the Magna Carta tradition over and against a king that needs money, but it doesn't really want to appeal to the people to, to get it. After that 1628 parliament, for a decade, Charles just doesn't convene parliament. He just doesn't do it. He just doesn't want to have to deal with them. And this is, I mean, it's disastrous for a number of reasons. Again, it's like closing that box and you have all these angry noblemen in there getting more and more frustrated, but unable to do anything. But Charles is running out of gas too, because he doesn't have money, right? So what happens eventually is there's a rebellion in Scotland. Charles effectively, they, they try to impose a, a larger Britannic church, sort of a church over all of Britain and not just England. The Scots hate this. The Scots are very studly and rebellious people. They rebel. And now you've got to have money. You can't fight this war against Scotland if you're Charles without levying taxes. So he has to open the box. And he finally does. He actually does it twice because first the first time he, it happens, they're they're so kind of contentious that he just dissolves them again. That's called the short parliament. But then he has to conv- he convenes them again, and this is called the long parliament, extremely famous moment in English history. Uh, and, and this is the scene un- into which uh, Milton is basically going to, to walk. He's not a member of parliament, but this is what they've been doing. Um, and they pass a bunch of, of acts. Importantly, they pass an act called the Triennial Act, which says they're going to convene every three years, king or no, right? They have to, parliament is sort of asserting their own independence, essentially. And they start to take control. They, they, they do a bunch of this stuff. They, they execute one of the king's supporters, uh, the Earl of Strafford, for treason. And again, as in the Magna Carta sort of battle between the barons and, and King John, you effectively end up with the, the people and the king, t- or the parliament rather, and the king taking up arms against each other. War ensues 1642 to 1646, and Parliament wins. So then you have this period called, uh, well, actually, so, so then you have this sort of period of a parliamentary rule, essentially. And down the line, after they have a second civil war, and they, they end up deposing and killing King Charles. For a while, he's a sort of political prisoner of Parliament. He summons a rebellion from Scotland to kind of take, oh, try to, to take his power back, and they execute him for treason in 1649, which is, a, I mean, shocking. It's impossible to describe what a huge deal 
it is that they have not only basically risen up to to take Parliament takes control of England, but they also depose and kill their king. Regicide is not a matter ever to be taken lightly, really. Um, and 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 this in 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 the English tradition, it is in many ways kind of it, it's the last act of a drama that began with Magna Carta in some ways, right? We, we, we went back to 1215, we were starting the story. Now we lead at least to the most thrilling part. I mean, really that story's never over. But so, so that's what's going on in England. Incredibly tumultuous time. Enter John Milton, right? So Milton is a, a very educated, magnificent writer, uh, sophisticated guy, not yet the famous poet that he will one day be. As I said, he, he writes Paradise Lost eventually in 1667. Uh, but this is before all of that. He comes, he goes on a trip to the continent as a, as a young man and then comes back in 1639. So kind of right as all of this stuff is, is heating up. He's not a member of parliament, but he's there while the short and the long parliament are happening. And he is a parliamentarian. He believes in Parliament's cause. Um, in fact, if anything, he's more radical than much of, of Parliament itself, because there are still, there's still royalists in Parliament. And then there are some people who sort of think, well, you know, taking over the, uh, the state is too much. Deposing the king would be too much. Milton will eventually write in defense of the regicide. So that's where he's at, right? He's, he's way on the side of let the people be free. Some would say sort of extremely so. And uh, at this point, remember, you know, eventually Oliver Cromwell is going to uh, sort of stage almost a military coup and become kind of a military dictator. But at this point, we are dealing with a parliament that is kind of, it's like they, they grab the ball and they don't know what to do with it. You know, it's the dog that catches up with the truck. Like they, they, they take over and now they're having all of these internal debates about just what, how they are going to lead now that they've got the power that they've, they've grabbed. But Milton's essentially on the side of, of the parliament. One of the big questions that they're debating right now is kind of who's going to, how is the church going to lead its individual parishes? And they have effectively ousted, um, they have ousted the prelates, they're called, or prelates, who were effectively bishops chosen by the Archbishop of Canterbury, so centrally chosen, in favor of presbyters, which is where you have Presbyterians, right? The presbyters are elected sort of within local dioceses and churches. And Milton is, again, in favor of strong localism here. He really believes in kind of uh, ground up uh, self-rule, essentially. While all of this is happening, the grand and fascinating irony is that Parliament, having gained control, starts to do some of the things that Milton himself was mad at the king about. And one of those things is they pass this law in 1643, the Licensing Act. Now, the Licensing Act, it's important to get this right because people think a lot about censorship when they talk about this you know, free speech in this period in history. The Licensing Act is not censorship. Censorship is where something is published and then you you erase it from history or you, you do something basically to kind of cancel it out, right? It's, it, censorship is, is true cancel culture. Licensing is different and actually worse. Licensing is where the, the government basically reads everything before they will allow it to be published. They want to establish, you know, they, they want to establish what, what the cancel culture mob would love to establish, which is a government-sponsored body for vetting all views and ideas. Remember that this is the parliament that Milton supports, but he is appalled. He finds this appalling. And so in, in 1644, he publishes what is a, actually a pamphlet. It, it's written as if it were a speech to parliament, but it, it is not. It's a pamphlet that's disseminated. Pamphlets at this time are like the explosive medium in the same way that the internet now is this just big profusion of ideas and people fighting over freedom and fighting over their, their ideas. That's what, what writing prose pamphlets uh, with the printing press had had become. Of course, the printing press was a big fe feature of the Protestant Reformation. It, it, it enabled people to have this access not only to, to platforms of their own, but to ideas from all over the place. And that is one of the ways in which the Catholic Church kind of lost its centralized control on doctrine. This only got more intense after the Reformation as the years rolled on. And at this point, you know, some of the first newspapers are coming into being uh, during this same period. And, and this was a high stakes 
game. You know, I mentioned earlier Milton's pamphlet, which he would eventually write in favor of regicide, in defense of the execution of, of King Charles I. And spoiler alert, <laughs> when eventually the Stuart, Stuart monarchy came back into power, uh, his, his pamphlet in favor of the regicide was called Iconoclastes was burned and he was put in jail and could easily have been hanged or killed, drawn and quartered. There were all sorts of gruesome ways in which, uh, in which speech was punished in this time. It was only basically because Milton had like friends in high places that he was able to get out of prison. And that is, that's what we're dealing with here. We are not dealing with kind of like anonymous comment posters online. We are dealing with, with John Milton putting his whole livelihood and self on the line. He's done it already before. He, he has written, for example, in favor of divorce for reasons of inca- incompatibility, which again, pisses off his natural allies, it pisses off the Puritans who are uh, shocked and appalled by this. And, and, and so, so Milton has established his reputation as somebody that genuinely puts his money where his mouth is, so to speak. Right? He, he believes in free speech and he practices it Everybody else be damned. The devil take the hindmost, right? He will go in front of any audience, no matter how, uh, no matter how powerful, and he will speak and write his mind. So at least, at, at the very least, we know that Milton believes in what he's writing because he's putting putting his life in many ways on the line. In Areopagitica, he he makes what is essentially his reasoned argument for why people should be allowed to do this without licensing. He actually, and we're going to get into this, he doesn't argue against censorship. He does still actually believe that certain books, especially you know, a- atheistic books actually, and, and libelous books should be taken out of the public view once the public has reacted to them in a strong and, and passionate way. What he doesn't believe is that the government, like 20 guys or one guy, should be able to kind of make those decisions before anybody even gets to see what's been what's been written. So let's get into his arguments for kind of why why he does this. He he calls the speech Areopagitica because the Areopagus, he's gesturing back here to a, a hill in Greece where the uh where, where Greek orators would address the the legal bodies, the legislative councils and the, the, the councils of the people. So he's gesturing back here to the, the origins of political freedom in the West, right? To the origins of democracy. And it's in particular, he's thinking of Isocrates, who was another kind of neglected orator who wrote speeches that weren't always delivered. And Isocrates wrote an Areopagitica as well, in which he argued for kind of the, you know, the old Athenian ways of of, you know, pop, of of popular sovereignty and freedom and and democracy and so he's he's Milton is gesturing back here to that he's situating himself within that tradition to say you know I am here arguing in the best and most ancient traditions of the West um, Saint Paul also famously gave a speech at the Areopagus uh, to the Athenians so it's it, that is an idea of kind of standing up and speaking your mind when when you could get killed for it basically so he's just uh, he, he's kind of situating himself within that tradition and and Milton was you know classically educated in the best possible sense he he read and even composed in a bunch of languages, Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, Latin, all of these incredible uh, compositions. And, and he advocated that people, that kids should basically be taught Greek and Latin from like from the womb, you know, and that's an exaggeration, but he was himself a school teacher and he believed in, in, in deep classical learning of the kind that we are sort of working through together here on this show. And, and he demonstrates in the, in the area of Pagetica why that's so important, because everybody around him is kind of going in one direction. And because he has this huge view of history, he's able to draw back into the past and say, you know, the great civilizations of the West, Greece at its height, Rome at its height, the, you know, these civilizations were, were civilizations of incredible freedom uh, and, and, and freedom to publish and to write. And, and, and he says, and, and that is the tradition that we should be standing in. But Parliament is basically standing in the tradition of the Inquisition, which is an incredibly incendiary thing to say in this speech, because these are Protestants. Inquisition is like the big bugbear, you know, and he says they basically started, the Catholic Church started coming down hard on speech 
when the Protestant Reformation was beginning, when, when Wycliffe and Zwinglius, who were these kind of reformers, precursors to the Reformation, when they became, he says, terrible, when, he, when they became frightful to the church, they, they shut, shut him down. And that's what you're doing now in Parliament, basically. So that's kind of his first foray, is to use that, that classical learning and that broad sweep of history to ally himself with all the great civilizations of the past. So here's what Milton says about freedom of speech in the ancient world. He has these great lines, says, and, and this is the wonderful thing about Milton, right? Is he, not only is he a great thinker, but he's a tremendously uh, skillful rhetorician and, and, and prose stylist. He says, I find but two sorts of writings, which the magistrate, this is in Greece, which the magistrate cared to take notice of, those either blasphemous and atheistical or libelous. And then later, as you sort of summing up this whole thing, right, the issue of the brain was no more stifled than the issue of the womb. No envious Juno sat cross-legged over the nativity of any man's intellectual offspring. This is a reference to, in, in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, a lot of times it was imagined that one of the gods, one of the goddesses would, would stand over women as they gave birth. And he's saying that they, they, they did not do the same thing when people were giving birth to books and, and to, to speeches, that this, they had this sort of great uh, small L liberalism about this, this sort of thing. And, and, and that is the tradition in which Milton uh, wants to situate himself. So now this is, this is the important thing to remember, actually, or one of the important things to remember is that uh, he's not against shutting down uh, atheistic and libelous texts, especially after they've been published. He, he's not a, a kind of free speech radical in the way that we might think of it now. He, he has a, a more qualified view, but he's, he's highly in favor of a, of a wide, broad liberalism before things have been published, letting things out there into the, into the public view. Now, many of his arguments for this form of liberalism, for free speech, you will already probably have heard before. They, these are arguments that have filtered into the bloodstream of the West. They became especially part of the American tradition. In many cases, they, they, they came through John Stuart Mill, who's another thinker that we'll talk about in a, in a separate episode. That's for another episode. But, but Milton's arguments, a lot of Milton's arguments for free speech will be, will be familiar to you. So one, one of them is that you'll probably have heard of is um, that, that licensing books basically puts the worst people in charge of literature, right? Because you, you, you really want a bunch of government bureaucrats being the people to tell the, the authors who they, they should, what they should and shouldn't say and, and what they're able to do. So I'm just going to read the, his sort of statement of that because it's, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty amusing and, and very well composed. I am reading here from the Penguin Classics edition, which is, which is William Poole, edited by, by William Poole. If you I, 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 it's pretty good. If you want my recommended edition of Milton, it's a giant compilation by, uh, edited by Merritt Hughes, Complete Poems and Major Prose. So go and find that. But uh, that one's so huge that I just, I'm just reading out of this one here. So, so here's, here's what Milton says. He says, when a man writes to the world, he summons up all his reason and deliberation to assist him. He searches, meditates, is industrious, and likely consults and confers with his judicious friends. After all which done, he takes himself to be informed in what he writes, as well as any that writ before him. If in this the most consummate act of his fidelity and ripeness, no years, no industry, no former proof of his abilities can bring him to that state of maturity as not to be still mistrusted and suspected unless he carry all his considerate diligence, all his midnight watchings and expense of palladian oil to the hasty view of an, of an unleasured licenser, perhaps much his younger, perhaps far his inferior in judgment, perhaps one who never knew the labor of book writing, and if he be not repulsed or slighted, must appear in print like a puny with his guardian and his censor's hand on the back of his title to be his bail and surety that he is no idiot or seducer. It cannot be but a dishonor and derogation to the author, to the book, to the privilege and dignity of learning. So this obviously high flight of rhetoric here, basically saying, look, Authors, true, true literary craftsmen, pour their heart and soul into grasping their subject and articulating it well. 
and you're going to let some Philistine basically tell them, some guy that knows nothing, tell them whether or not that what they've written is, is acceptable to publish and okay to publish. Now, Milton knows that not every writer is like this, and we're going to get to his arguments about that a little bit later. What happens if the, if the author actually isn't this sort of diligent and principled person? He's saying, why should you put this government bureaucrat in power over people that slave away day and night over just precisely the right phrase, and they're going to have them crashing in, these sort of like inept editors? Besides which, he says, and this is really relevant to us now, he says, if only these few government sort of uh, potentates decide what gets published. How will we ever find new truth? And this is something, again, that, that really rings and resonates with a Protestant audience because Protestants know exactly what this is like. Again, the printing press was a big way that the Protestants were able to get their case out there over and above the governing authority of the Catholic Church, which in many cases just wanted to stamp them out. You're saying, how would that ever have happened, Milton says, if you hadn't had people giving access to new and in some cases quite incendiary and explosive ideas? And he says, in, in fact, if you keep going on this path of licensing, you're eventually going to go backward and stamp out all the old truths that don't conform to your present idea. And he's just shown, right, how important ancient truth is for kind of taking you out of the present moment and helping you to understand your broader context. So he says, you are going to go back and basically just, you know, snip out all the passages from other books that you that you don't like. So he says, Nay, which is more lamentable, if the work of any deceased author, though never so famous in his lifetime, and even to this day, come to their hands for license to be printed or reprinted, if there be found in his book one sentence of an adventurous edge uttered in the height of zeal, and who knows whether it might not be the dictate of a divine spirit, yet not suiting with every low, decrepit humor of their own, though it were Knox himself, the reformer of a kingdom that spake it, they will not pardon him their dash. So, this is cancel culture. He's talking about cancel culture. He's talking about going back into the past and undoing the work of the great revolutionaries of the past, which again, he, he's, he's purposefully putting his finger on that, that Protestant nerve, right? That people know that they got where these, these Protestants know they got where they were by being able to speak freely. He's saying, now you're just going to freeze thought in time. You're going to freeze the development of thought so that nothing new can come into being. That in and of itself would be enough, right? That is a tremendously powerful argument, beautifully written. But there's more to Milton than just that. Some of that, as I said, some of that might be familiar. But Milton is, is saying a couple things here that are crucial and that we sometimes forget when we talk about free speech and cancel culture. Here is the first thing. And I mentioned this at the beginning. He knew, Milton knew what the stakes of writing and, and words were. Eventually, writing was going to get him imprisoned, his own writing. He had already run into trouble with his treatise about divorce. Other people that he knew had gotten into trouble. Words in Milton's day, pamphlets, published text, could contribute to the deposition of a king, right? There, there was so much power and he understood that people would misuse that power. And this is, this is something we forget. He is not just an optimist about, yes, we will all progress happily toward the truth. He knows that if you, if you open up that Pandora's box of people's free speech, you're going to get a ton of stuff. But, he says, Wycliffe and Hus were also in that box. These are the, the sort of precursors to the Reformation, right? So, so the Reformation itself, the new truth that they were all indebted to in that, in that parliament that's also in the box. So if you close the box, you don't get that truth, even though, you know, you, you, you also, when you open the box, you get all of this other kind of, you know, atheistical stuff and bad stuff that you might, and in the end, indeed have to kind of clamp down on. Um, and so, so it's not just like a, Hey man, anything goes, let a, f a thousand flowers bloom thing, right? This is not just like get all of the ideas out there because all of them are equally good. Milton believes in absolute truth. And we're going to come back to this. He does not just think that all writing is of equal value, but he does think that you can't know what the new truth is going to be unless you let everything come out into the world. So, so here is where I think Milton's theology comes into play. And this is, again, this is the part that we don't think about or talk about 
quite as much. But Milton was a radical theologian, and and in many cases he was even uh, you know he outsteps the bounds of orthodoxy. So there have been people who have criticized him for that, and I think that's valid. But but on this one point, he is absolutely insistent. And what's uh, as I will show, it's going to come back again in Paradise Lost. But he's, he it's actually here already in the area Pagitica. He says, I conceive, therefore, that when God did enlarge the universal diet of man's body, saving ever the rules of temperance, he then also, as before, left arbitrary the dieting and repasting of our minds. He's saying God knows that we can eat ourselves to death, but he gives us free will to exercise temperance, to choose to do things uh, to, to, to choose to eat well and to choose to take care of ourselves. The same is true in our minds. He says, as wherein every mature man might have to exercise his own leading capacity. How great a virtue is temperance. How much of moment through the whole life of man. Yet God commits the managing so great a trust without particular law or prescription wholly to the demeanor of every grown man. He is arguing that God would rather have man free than have him perfect. And this is going to be the central observation of Paradise Lost. We know that Milton was was sort of meditating on Paradise Lost for a long time before he wrote it. He says in, in Paradise Lost that he spent a long time thinking about writing an epic, and then he finally, in the end, in the 1660s, came to, to writing it. But the germ of this observation is there already, that, that God gives man free will because only with free will can man choose to love God. Now, of course, that also creates the sin of the world. And in the Christian worldview, that, that means the fall. It means everything that is wrong comes because of that one choice of God's to give man, to give Adam free choice. And, and, and Milton is emphatic that that is worth it and that God, he believes, thinks that that freedom is worth it. It's worth it in, in the Garden of Eden just as much as it is worth it at the printing press, right? So let me read to you this passage now that in which he, he really comes out with this. He says, many there be that complain of divine providence for suffering Adam to transgress foolish tongues. He's saying these people are idiots when they say that God shouldn't have allowed Adam to sin. When God gave him, that is Adam, when God gave him reason, he gave him freedom to choose for reason is but choosing. He had been else a mere artificial Adam, such an Adam as he is in the motions. We ourselves esteem not of that obedience or love or gift, which is of force. God, therefore, left him free. This is, Milton believes this to his core and it's, it's pretty radical. It's, it's hard even for us to kind of feel confident, I think, endorsing Milton in this. Many Christians disagree with him, I think, uh, but Milton says the divine providence was such that the, the fall of man was what is called a felix culpa, a lucky fault. Um, and this is fleshed out all throughout Paradise Lost. I'm just going to read now some passages from Paradise Lost that kind of express this in its highest form. And then we'll come back to how it applies, right, to, to freedom of speech, which is, again, that, that's what he's arguing for here in the Area Vegetica. So this is from book three of Paradise Lost, Milton's great epic about the fall of man. And God is talking here about the rebellious angels, who in some cases people think that the rebellious angels kind of stand in for the, the English rev revolutionaries, the people, the parliament that Milton stood with and eventually failed, right? But God says this about the rebellious angels. He says, freely they stood who stood, and fell who fell. Not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith or love, where only what they needs must do appeared, not what they would? What praise could they receive? Right? So there's echoes here of this, of this revolution, right? The, the, the freedom to choose is the freedom to choose good as well as evil, and you can't have one without the other. This is again in, in book five of Paradise Lost, when God is talking, when God the Father is talking to Christ, the Son, about this, he, he turns to his son and, and, and talks about these angels smiling. So he's, this has disturbed a lot of people that God smiles about the rebellion, the, the, the satanic rebellion and eventually the fall of man. Why? Because he believes that this ultimately works out to the good. And finally, in book 12, this is lines 469 and onward, Adam himself 
basically says, this is good. He says, oh, goodness infinite. He's seen the future and he's seen the incarnation and the crucifixion and the salvation of man. And Adam says, oh, goodness infinite, goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce and evil turn to good. More wonderful than that which by creation first brought forth light out of darkness. Full of doubt I stand whether I should repent me now of sin by me done and occasioned, or rejoice much more that much more good thereof shall spring. To God more glory, more goodwill to men. From God and over wrath, grace shall abound. It's a lot to to sort of reckon with that Adam here is saying, I, I don't even know whether I should be sad that I, that I fell. But I mean, and think about this again, this is not like child's play, right? The fall of man in Christian doctrine occasions all the horrors of the world, which we know, right? All the tragedy, all the failures, all the abandonment, the death, the pain, the suffering. Milton says, in order to be free, to choose, to be real human beings, that had to, we had to have the capacity to also choose all of this, this awful and this evil. And in the end, God used it as the occasion for an, a far, far greater thing than could ever have happened if we hadn't fallen, if we hadn't had the uh, option to fall. Why does this apply to free speech? Well, because when you open that box, right, when you open that Pandora's box, you will get dangerous stuff. You will get words. This is why actually the cancel culture people that want to silence oppositional speech, they understand something actually about speech, which is that it is powerful, that it can affect tremendous change, and that shutting it down is one of the key ways to gain power. Now, of course, I personally don't want them to have that power, but they reckon with what Milton reckons with, which is that speech can be dangerous. He says, Milton says, unlike the cancel culture people, Milton says, that danger is worth it because it's the only way you're going to get the truth out. Now, this is, this is something that we're actually struggling with on all sides of the political aisle right now. There are people, smart people, who, who think that Milton was basically wrong about this because Milton has this faith that the truth will win eventually in what's called the marketplace of ideas. But you can read people, uh, you know, Adrian Vermeule is one, for example, who, who, who don't think that this is real, that the marketplace of ideas is too subject to coercion to really allow the truth um, to win out. Milton has a, one of the most beautiful passages of this speech he basically says why he thinks that the truth will win out, even though other people in his day were saying, no, 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 we, we can't let all of this. It was, it was this, the fragmenting of the church that really bothered people because they just split up the Catholic church. And now it was continuing to break up into these, these sects, these kind of various different reformed sects that we live with today. Here is what Milton has to say about all of that. He says, for as in a body, when the blood is fresh, the spirits pure and vigorous, not only to vital but to rational faculties, and those in the acutest and the pertest operations of wit and subtlety, it argues in what good plight and constitution the body is. So when the cheerfulness of the people is so sprightly up as that it has not only wherewith to guard well its own freedom and safety, but to spare and to bestow upon the solidest and sublimest points of controversy and new invention, it betokens us not degenerated, nor drooping to a fatal decay, but casting off the old and wrinkled skin of corruption to outlive these pangs and wax young again, entering the glorious ways of truth and prosperous virtue destined to become great and honorable in these latter ages. Methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant as powerful nation, rousing herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible locks. Methinks I see her as an eagle mewing in her mighty youth and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday beam, purging and unscaling her long abused sight at the fountain itself of heavenly radiance, while the whole noise of timorous and flocking birds with those also that love the twilight flutter about, amazed at what she means, and in their envious gabble would prognosticate a year of sects and schisms. It's very beautiful. What the hell does it mean? So uh, Milton is envisaging here, he's saying, everybody says that the fact that we're kind of arguing, we have this passionate debate back and forth, that's our decadence, that we're kind of dissolving into all these schisms and sects. 
But I say this is a sign of our health. This is, this is the lifeblood. The fact that we're messy, the fact that we're fighting shows that we're alive. That's Milton's big argument for letting this thing happen. He says, yes, we're going through a period of, of fragmentation and splitting apart, but we will return back together again because this is our way forward to truth. We, you, know, you have to kind of let this. He basically says, you know, Christ brought truth onto the earth and it did not, truth did not stay whole. Truth was basically, you know, there are all sorts of people who kind of try to distort the truth. And in order to get back to the truth that Christ brought, we have to allow a multiplicity of views to, to flourish and debate with one another. It is an open question whether Milton was, was right about this, I think. In his own day, he did not succeed. <laughs> um, the, the licensing act remained in effect. In fact, licensing got, got stronger. And at some point, Milton himself became a licensor. Now, this is kind of an irony, but I suspect he did it because he thought, well, I mean, it goes back to this thing that the people in charge of publication should be the people who know what good publication even is, right? And why, why it matters. And so he kind of, he says, if it has to be done, basically, he's going to do it. But as I said, you know, the Stuart monarchy was, was, was re-established. Uh, Milton himself was imprisoned. His books burned. Um, he suffered the consequences of standing on his principles, which whatever you may believe about, you know, what's, what's right and wrong in his argument, that alone is a fantastic argument for him. I think that he was willing to stand by himself and his principles in that way. But what does this do for us, right? This is, this is to me the, the great next question. Yeah. All of this stuff happened hundreds of years ago. We are dealing now with our own convulsions. And the question is, was Milton right in the end? Does, does our tradition of letting people speak freely lead us in the end to chaos and dissolution? Or will the truth at last win out? Now, I, my answer is qualifiedly, the truth will win out. So, so here's the thing, right? The reason Milton can argue so ferociously for freedom of speech is because he believes that the truth will win out in a culture that believes in truth. He's surrounded basically by Christians who are arguing within themselves about, amongst themselves, about how to find God's truth. And they all agree that, you know, atheism is wrong, but they're here to kind of get together and find and find some absolute truth. Now, our version of that won't look exactly the same, but, but the key thing that we have to remember here is like we, freedom of speech, you actually can't have it unless you agree that there is truth that you're trying to get to. That's the first thing that we have to recover because our opponents here in this, the, the people who want to cancel everybody, they think that speech is just power, right? They think that speech doesn't, there is no absolute truth. And so in order, they, what they have to do is get the power and silence your speech and win. We believe that speech is powerful, but that it's for something, that we're, we're using it to seek out truth. And that's what the key, one of the key things that I draw here from Milton that I think we have sometimes forgotten is that that's the whole context of his argument is that we're, he's looking here, not just for kind of everybody to be chattering away, but for out of the chattering there to emerge some vision of, of a way forward and a truth. Here's the other thing that occurs to me. So I have been looking at cancel culture as basically a sign of decadence. And in one sense, of course, surely it is, right? It's, just, it's a sign of decadence that we don't, that all of this stuff, all of this history that we've been talking about on this show, like is kind of lost or it's being canceled or it's, it's viewed as sort of racist or whatever. That in itself is a sign of, of decay. But the fact that we are having this big impassioned fight about speech, as Milton himself says, it might actually be kind of a sign of life. Let me say what I mean by that. So these moments, these battles over free speech occur when a new medium comes into being and blows the door open on the power of speech. Suddenly people remember how powerful speech is and what its consequences can be. And when that happens, when people re recall that, there are two reactions. One is, yes, let us use this to kind of move forward into what, what, what the truth is. Others say, no, 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 you've got to stop that. You've got to shut that down because it is, it's, it's dangerous. And Milton's argument is basically that, that happened with the printing press, that the printing press blew the doors open on all of these views. And the Catholic church basically said, stop that. <laughs> and, and, and that there was this kind of back and forth between that, the, those two powers. In our day, we have a new medium. It's the internet, right? Social media and the internet have come into being and blown the doors open again so that all of these established 
opinion making centers, the New York Times, the Pulitzer Center, and so forth, CNN, which it, which had had a grip on you know who gets to get a platform. Suddenly, all of these voices, these independent voices from outside, were saying all of this stuff, and people remembered again. Oh, right, this that is like you know you're only seeing this one piece of the puzzle and now all of this all these people are out here saying good and bad things and interesting things and false things and there is danger in that and and some people react to that and they say great like let's move let's figure out how to move forward healthfully into this new arena of free speech other people want to crack down and that's what cancel culture is that's how to understand it in the broader sweep of history right it is the it is the mo- motion the sort of motion that always comes with a new profusion of life and a new profusion of speech, there is always a, a countervailing reaction. And it's always the job of principled people to argue again, as Milton did, for the truth and for, for, for free speech as a route to absolute truth. If we can recover that, we'll win. <laughs> and we actually will. This is the, the thing. If you, if you remember, if you recall that speech is not only powerful, but is a powerful instrument for getting at the truth, we can still yet recover ourselves from this this cancel culture moment. That is my opinion. After having thought deeply about John Milton during this time and his his experience with Parliament and the uh, English Civil Wars. Okay, the mailbag. I love doing mailbag questions. You guys send me such interesting stuff. And this was a great question I've had sitting actually in my inbox for a while, and I wanted to get to it now uh, at last. He this guy wrote into me about basically about cancel culture, about all the stuff that we've been talking about and this sort of impulse to just tear down the statues and the books and the ideas that have built America and more broadly that have been central to the West. And he said, there, there must be some resource for dealing with that in Western civilization itself, because it can't be the first time it's happened. Very smart question. He says, what story, myth, or classical writing exists to present this notion that one becomes so intent on destroying a target, they resultingly destroy everything in the process? Well, uh, since you're asking about classical writing, I assume you mean like sort of my greatest loves of ancient Greece and Rome. And so, I mean, because we talked a lot about um, about Milton's own response to some of this on this episode, but but in the cla- in classical antiquity, there is one text which we will do in another episode. But just to answer your question, Euripides, who is kind of the third of the three great tragic playwrights who survive from ancient Greece, his very last play was called Bacchae, and the Bacchae are the the kind of the women who go crazy because of Dionysus. And we talked in a while back about Dionysus, the god of wine and frenzy and theater and passion. And, and Dionysus in Bacchae sort of comes to Thebes. He comes to this Greek-speaking uh, city-state run by an incredibly sort of regimented leader. And he wreaks havoc. And because the leader isn't basically equipped to respond to and to incorporate the havoc of the Dionysiac passion, uh, everything goes to pot. And I won't say more about it because we're going to do a whole episode on it. I, I love Bacchae. It's one of my favorite tragedies. And it, it has been sort of talked about as Euripides' view into the excesses of democracy, um, which I think is a, a fairly plausible reading of it. And so we'll, we'll, we'll sort of get into that. But go away and find those the University of Chicago uh, editions of the tragedies. And the, the, the Bacchae, Euripides' Bacchae is, I think, a really great text to be starting with. I don't know when we'll get to it on this show, but we will get to it. Thank you for that question. And thank you all for listening. This has been a joy, as always, to record. If you like this show, you will love the work that we do over at the Claremont Institute. They are my employers, and they generously allow me to go off and do this side project, which I love so much. So please check them out. Check us out at claremontreviewofbooks.com and americanmind.org. Those are our two publications. And especially if you feel inspired to donate and support the work we do in defense of the American idea, you can go to claremont.org slash donate and make sure to tell them in the notes that we sent you. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Young Heretics. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Bye.